Hi again and welcome back to the Global AI Student Conference. In our next season, we will talk about the four types of machine learning. And let's welcome Frank Lavin, a data and AI architect at Microsoft, and MSDNS columnist, a blogger, and a broadcaster. Hi, Frank. You might be on mute right now, Frank, but we love your background. It's super cool. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. I may have a problem collecting monitors. <laughs> no, that's a good problem to have. Indeed it is. Indeed it is. Um, so I just want to update the, uh, I didn't update the bio. I actually now work at Red Hat. So um, that's why I had little fedora back there and, um, you know, um, and I'm excited to talk about the, the four types of machine learning and some of the innovations that have been happening in this space. Yeah, thank you. I saw before uh, going to your presentation, could you like to tell us about uh, your podcast and your blog? Yeah, sure. So my podcast is called Data Driven, and uh, we, uh, we've been online now about six, seven years, and uh, we have about 315 episodes. I co-host it with my good friend, Andy Leonard, and uh, he's the data engineer, I'm the data scientist, so we kind of cover the whole spectrum of what the data world consists of. I absolutely love that. I feel like now I'm super interested in that podcast. And also, I just love your background again with the red hat specifically. <laughs> well, and then, thank you. Now, so when I get home, I'll definitely be listening to the data driven podcast. Would you like to tell us a little bit about your blog as well? Sure. So I run a blog called franksworld.com. And fun fact, I registered, I started Frank's World in 1995, and it's been online in one form or the other yeah. since then. So uh, it's, it's, it, my oldest child is going to be 13 uh, this week. It's kind of, I, I think of Frank's World as kind of my, my really my first child. <laughs> That's absolutely amazing. I mean, what an accomplished to have, especially for our students listening into the audience at the very beginning of their careers. Like if they want to be you <laughs> in a couple <laughs> decades, they want to start writing their blogs posts now. So I think that is super impressive. With that, we'll let you kick off with your presentation. Awesome. Thank you very much. All right. So hopefully, I guess I have to share my screen. Yes. All right. I will share my screen. So many monitors, it's always hard to know which screen to share. All right. So hopefully you can see my screen. And um, yes. my name is Frank Lavinia, and we're going to talk about the four types of machine learning. And... Um, as I mentioned before, you can catch me. I am now at Red Hat, so there's a little fedora. But you can check me out at Frank Diggs Data on social media. I'm there on Twitter and Instagram, datadriven.tv and franksworld.com. Uh, we did mention the Data Science Podcast, and uh, I forgot to mention that we are, uh, we're just above two, um, 250,000 downloads. All right. So I'm going to talk now about the four types of machine learning, right? They're supervised, unsupervised, reinforcement, and transfer learning. But of course, this is a field that waits for no one. There's more. Um, and you know, this is a fast moving field. And if you're a student in this, uh, in this field, this is both an exciting and an intimidating time to be in this industry because uh, you, know, you could be up to date on all the latest innovations and then 20 minutes later, not so much. So it definitely helps to have uh, an innate sense of curiosity. Uh, but what's really cool about this is, is kind of what's changing in this category but but for the most part i like to think of this as solution categories right what are you really what what's the problem you're trying to solve and honestly in my career the technology is cool but ultimately what 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 makes the uh what what pays the bills as it were or what keeps me going is the problems i solve for customers right i am i i like to solve problems that's kind of that that, that innate engineer uh in me and, um, you know, uh, it's one of those things. Now, you'll notice on one of those, on none of those slides, I mentioned neural networks. And neural networks are a fascinating kind of look at the innovation that has happened in this space. When I first started in this, there were really only one, maybe two different types of neural networks. You just kind of put um, everything into various layers, and there were different types of layers. Um, but now, there's all sorts of neural network architectures. Um, and... Let me uh, let me turn it over to my my virtual co-host here. 
Um, it would, to speak really to um, the, um, the, the, the fast moving nature of this field. So surely by now you've heard of chat GPT. Open AI is, 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 um, is backed in large part by Microsoft and other industry leaders. But what's fascinating about this is how good this is. How many types of machine learning are there? So what's interesting is, and I have a screenshot captured just in case this goes wrong, um, but basically, um, well, this is funny. This is a completely different answer than before, which is just very fascinating to kind of play around with this uh, tool. Ultimately, it told me that there were four different types of machine learning, but it didn't quite match up with my list, which goes to show you kind of just how in silly this industry could be sometimes because they'll, they'll want to categorize things right that's kind of a human nature um and there's a lot of buzzwords in this field right business analyst data analyst problem solution organization right but you know what it's late in the day at least where i am let's talk cake because everybody likes cake um all right so let's explore this analogy because there's really kind of a way of looking at the, the this field now um these are the four categories i've come up with but for the most part let's think about it in terms of cake, right? So the cake itself is unsupervised learning. In order to get anything to work, uh, you need large amounts of data, right? Well, this massive amount of quality, uh, quantity of data, right? Not necessarily quality in that sense, right? So you'll, you'll have to, basically what you do is you just get enough data and eventually you start uh, clustering it, graphing it and, uh, and, and clusters will start to form and then you'll get an idea of how these things get categorized. Secondly, and this is the one that most people really start with, is this supervised learning. And that's really the icing on the cake, so to speak. Um, and that's really was the idea that you have data, but you also have it labeled. So in other words, you know that if given a particular record, you know that this person um, uh, survived the Titanic, right? Or this person did not, right? That's labeled data. So you know what the ground truth is, so that way, you can go through uh, and, and the algorithm can sort through it and find the patterns in the data that you can't see quite so easily, all right? Reinforcement learning requires even less samples, in some cases, even no samples of all, at all. And, and this is the idea, and we'll talk more about this later. That's kind of the cherry on top. Now, finally, the candle uh, is transfer learning, which basically you start with a pre-trained model and then you add another layer on top to kind of explain what it is. A great example of this is the Azure Custom Vision Service, which I believe my previous pre presenter had referenced. And um, it, you, you, it is a pre-trained computer vision model that you just add an extra layer, right? So an example of, you know, this is, this is a cat, this is a dog, and, you know, you don't have to explain all of the fundamentals of, uh, of computer vision or train it from the get-go. Now, this is actually becoming more and more uh, increasingly important. A lot of these language models um, uh, require a lot of GPU and CPU uh, effort to go, GPT-3 uh, being one of them. But what you do is you can basically start from that pre-trained model and then uh, work from there. So uh, you can really kind of build on an existing foundation. Now, um, Let's let's talk about that, right? So given a picture set of cats and dogs, what does this look like, right? Well, supervised learning um, is, you know, you tell the computer which photos contain a cat and which ones contain a dog, right? And then given enough samples, it will, um, you know, it, it will be able to kind of reverse engineer the differences between cats and dogs. Uh, unsupervised learning is you just give it pictures of cats and dogs and you you find some kind of property uh, or, or multiple properties and eventually the patterns will start emerging and they'll start clustering around that. Reinforcement learning is the idea that you show it a picture of a dog and it will take a guess, is it a dog or a cat? And then you give it a point, uh, you, you, you reward the computer for right answers or punish it for, for wrong answers. Basically, you give it a point uh, you know, congratulations, 10 points, you got the, the you picked the dog, uh, minus you, 10 if you, you picked, you chose a cat when it was actually a picture of a dog, vice versa. Uh, and transfer learning, let's hold that thought for transfer learning. Now, which one of these is the hunted and which one of these is the hunter? Well, chances are, uh, you know, if uh, you're just starting your career, you're younger than I am, and I'm not even old enough to have ever seen dinosaurs in person. Um, but however, we know through movies um, like Jurassic Park and whatnot, but we also know, even if we hadn't seen those movies, that the, the, um, the, the animal with the big sharp teeth is probably the predator. 
right? Or the hunter. And the hunted is the light, small thing that is running as fast as it can, right? That's an example of transfer and learning that has been arguably built into our, uh, you know, fused into our DNA from since time immemorial, right? So the idea that you can kind of start with an existing model that you have and then work off of that. And that is essentially transfer learning. Now, transfer learning, uh, you know, like I said, um, leverages these pre-trained models. The pros are uh, minimal training. Cons are you still need a, a base model to start from. And, uh, but ultimately, that's, that's it in a nutshell. So one of the things that you'll find that's going to be very useful in your career is the ability to summarize things uh, in an elevator pitch because you never know who you're going to be stuck with for a finite period of time. So it's always good to get used to the idea of relaying complex uh, topics in a very short kind of way, right? Supervised learning, you know the answers already, the rules are inferred. Unsupervised, well, you don't know the answers, but eventually a pattern emerges. Reinforce learn reinforcement learning is you figure out the answer uh, through trial and error, right? Uh, it's very similar to how um, animals learn. Um, transfer learning, you rely on previous knowledge and previous answers. Uh, and basically, models trained on one task are repurposed to a second related uh, task. Now, at one point, you're probably wondering, like, hey, um, why, why would you do anything if you already knew the answers, right? Now, if you're a software engineer, chances are you're not a career software engineer like I used to be. But ultimately, here's the paradigm shift that's going to be very crucial and, and a different way of thinking that comes with the artificial intelligence and machine learning. Now, in traditional development, uh, what happens is um, you uh, get the data and then uh, you program in the rules and then answers are then computed. What machine learning does is kind of invert this a little bit because you give it the answers and you give it the data and then the rules are inferred, right? The computer will go through using a series of algorithms to go through and interpret what uh what the rules uh, are of any of of your um uh, of of what you're trying to figure out so for instance when i did work at microsoft i had one of my customers was a uh they made candy right they made licorice right and there was this huge stack of of of, of notebook rules that um the food scientists had crafted over decades right um and um, you know, basically, you know, what, what, how to mix the chocolate in, I mean, how to mix the chocolate in, how to mix the flavoring, the sugar, all that sort of thing. And they would be able to optimize the output of the candy. And they wanted to basically have the, the, the maximum output of candy for minimum out input of, of, um, of, of ingredients. Now, now I've already mentioned cake. I mentioned candy. Uh, could it be that I'm hungry? Who knows? But that's not the point. The point is, is that what they were able to do uh, a, a team of consultants was able to go and reverse engineer the rules by monitoring the data of what went into the machine and what came out of the machine. And they were able to, uh, within, I would say, probably a matter of weeks, be able to reverse engineer all the information that took decades for this company to kind of collate and put on paper. So that is that just shows you the power of this and, and what this can do. Now, supervised learning, you know, can really be it's not really about the tools that you use to solve it. It's really that you have the answers and ahead of time. It's, that's really what it's about. Um, you, the pros are it's very specific. The cons are is that this could be very labor intensive and labeling data uh, turns out to be, well, quite the, quite the booming industry uh, in terms of uh, what you'll have is getting the quality of, of data out there. So while the the data engineer or data scientists get the headlines, it's the data engineering and data engineers are really the unsung heroes of this field, right? So you'll hear a news story saying, "Hey, you know, uh, XYZ3 model came out and it was trained on 15 billion parameters or this much data." Now think about the amount of labor that had to go in to label that data, organize that data, sort that data so you can get it processed through and create a model out of. So that's really that's really kind of the cons of it because not all data is going to come naturally labeled. Um, now let's let's talk about decision boundaries. So what you're seeing here is just a graph and it represents uh, um, two classes of things, right? The circles and the triangles, right? And this is a what a linear classification is is what we're doing here. It's a linear or binary classification. Linear because we just draw a straight line defining 
uh, what is this and versus what is that binary because well there's really only two classifications and um, with that uh, let's do an experiment uh, with a neural network that I am certain everyone here uh, within the sound of my voice has uh, and that's your brain right um, so let's do an experiment now because this is remote I can't do this like I normally do in person but ultimately I'm going to show you pictures of dogs pictures of cats and you're going to tell me uh, which is which right should be easy enough all right um, so what's this all right there's really no interactive feature here but you know if you said dog congratulations you are correct all right next picture uh what is this all cat. right <laughs> it's a cat yes all right so now you're two for two what could slot what could be behind slide number three what is this <laughs> oh no <laughs> I'm going to go for cat. <laughs> All right. We have one vote for cat. Now, this is an interesting use case. So most of the time, people will say dog. Uh, I happen to know the ground truth because it's labeled data. Um, and the only people that have ever gotten it right was, one, I spoke at my son's school, and um, the one of the students in the class, her mom, was a veterinarian, right? So that child guessed correctly that it was a cat like you did um, and another person that I spoke at a user group uh, here in the DC area uh, ha had formerly been a veterinary technician so I find that interesting that they were able to tell and apparently the tell as it were are in the eyes um, so that gets you kind of this this idea of what the decision boundary is because ultimately what you're doing is you're mapping uh, qualities, I mean, you're doing this in your head, but you don't realize it. Like that's just how good nature is, is gotten at this. Um, and the distance from the decision boundary matters. So what, what that is really a fancy way of saying is something you probably learned in middle school, right? Is this uh, linear regression, right? That Y equals MX plus P. This is not rocket science per se. Um, uh, but this is a way to uh, kind of see how this goes. Now, I want to show you a, another real-world example of what how a decision boundary uh, and local, at least to me. So using two American football teams, um, I recently – this has been a crazy year for me. I changed jobs. I, I, I sold my old house. I bought a new house. So I'm actually much closer uh, to Baltimore now than I used to be. Uh, so basically, there's two major uh, American football teams in this area. And – one of the things I noticed when we were house hunting uh, was that there was kind of this idea uh, when we were house hunting like 15 years ago, uh, I noticed that different stores, uh, different gas stations, uh, supermarkets, you name it, would have different uh, material based on where we were looking for homes. And uh, there's basically Baltimore has the Ravens, the Washington's uh, team is now called the Commanders. Uh, or commandos, um, and basically, can we kind of see what our decision boundary looks in real life? So when we are house hunting, I noticed a distinct pattern here, and this pattern has actually shifted over the years as the Baltimore team has done way better <laughs> than the Washington team, but there still is a clear line here. So I've actually noticed that uh, the decision boundary, again, this is a linear classification problem. It's a little more nuanced than that in the real world, but come on, for a demo, for a simple example, this is it. So ultimately, you'll see that um, a couple of things here. You'll notice that, hey, Frank, you drew a line, but the line kind of leaves this, this, this point out and this point out as well. Uh, yes, that's right, because you're never going to get Anytime you have a model, there's going to be some level of what's called true, uh, false positives or false negatives, right? So in this case, this would be considered a false uh, – if I were given a, a lat long coordinates, if it was north and west of that line, I would assume that it would be Baltimore. If it's south of that line, I would assume it would be uh, D.C. Obviously, this would be a false, um, false negative or false positive. Um, based on, on that. So ultimately what you're gonna find is that there's always this, this line, and this is really more art than science, of how good is your model? And can you model overfit? And if I were to draw this line in such a way that I could bend this around, then that would really be an overfitted model because you're, this is, the short of it is to say that predicting the future is hard, right? And for fun fact, um, um, for fun fact that, that this would be the not instead of a mathematical dis distribution this would be the line if you are um 
if you are north and east of Route 32, State Route in, Mar in Maryland, or if you're north of Interstate 70, that's basically the borderline. Although I have noticed that uh, as the season goes on and things go better for Baltimore than Washington, that line does, has creeped south a bit. Um, but again, uh, why so Euclidean, right? Uh, it turns out that when we're dealing with these mathematical models, we're not really dealing with reality, right? So in that example, I'm dealing with a map, so there is some kind of correlation between reality. But one of the true powers of data science and advanced analytics is you, you can compare things in more than one dimension. In fact, um, in some cases, some problems I've been on is that we were comparing different aspects of, you know, classification A or B across hundreds of dimensions. Now, that's something that really melts your brain. But if you think about this is that uh, if, if you can imagine what's the shortest path between two points, well, it's a straight line. Well, if you view the world in kind of two dimensions, in that case, uh, the middle diagram here would be the straight line. However, in, as you add more dimensions, that short line can get shorter. Um, so and ultimately, uh, to, to paraphrase a line from The Matrix, which I guess to students of today, this is an old movie, um, you, it's not so, if the quote in this goes, he's the, the child actor here says it way more eloquently than I can, but ultimately it's not so much that the spoon bends, but your mind bends. So let's revisit this concept in terms of a binary linear classifier. Can you draw a straight line through this? So, so before I said you're never going to overfit a, a model, and, and and I'm saying like you're always going to have some kind of thing. Now I'm basically saying the opposite, right? Um, just as a thought experiment, could you draw a straight line to isolate the um, the red circles from the yellow circles? And the answer is you can't, right? Now, what if, what if indeed we were to add more dimensions to the problem? So let's try it now. Animation should kick off. Now you can draw a straight line that would cut through that very evenly. So hopefully um, this is your reaction. Uh, and again, another kind of movie reference, uh, you're not thinking fourth dimensionally from one of the Back to the Future films, uh, is basically what you're doing is creating a hyperplane, which is a the, the, the three-dimensional uh, uh, cousin of a, of a line or a straight linear classifier. Uh, and basically, by adding more dimensions, by getting more data or more facets of data, you can actually increase your accuracy. You can also introduce a lot more noise, a lot more bias, but that is a topic for another presentation. All right, so don't feel bad if you're not confused. Um, you're not paying attention. Uh, confusion is part of this. This is a uh, very kind of um, esoteric kind of things that normally we don't uh, encounter in our day-to-day -day lives, but this is becoming more and more of a thing. So um, it, uh, what I'm gonna talk about now is unsupervised learning. Like, what does this look like? Well, basically uh, the, the big algorithm here is basically about around clustering, right? Um, you know, the the Canonical example is iris um, iris species, where you know you can you can based on the the, the length of uh, of the petal to the width of the petal, uh, it will produce, and you'll see that you can kind of cluster. You'll notice that eventually uh, things start to cluster around certain patterns. Um, you now the good thing is that there's really no labor. You just get the data. Uh, uh, the cons are there's really no control over the data quality per se, uh, and there's no context, right? You, you don't know, like what you, you know, like in this chart here, all you see is, that, hey, there's a big green cluster here. What does that mean? There's a big red cluster here. What does that mean, right? So this is where the analysis, the human analysis part of it really matters. Now, I'm going to talk about something that I really gotten fascinated by of late, and this is called reinforcement learning. And this is the idea that computers can learn by trial and error. Um, now, Simulated, what you do to create this is generally a simulated environment, and that sounds really fancy, but, you know, uh, Super Mario Brothers could be considered a simulated environment in this situation. Um, another aspect of this is um, uh, using synthetic data or simulated data, and you're probably like, why would I want to use synthetic or simulated data? Well, it turns out in some cases, simulated or synthetic data is far superior than real data, which sounds really crazy when you think about it. Um, but one of the things that I want to point out here is that when you're building a reinforcement learning system, uh, careful thought has to go into 
what you're rewarding the agent for or the bot and what you're punishing it for because you can really wind up with some really bizarre unintended consequences. So synthetic data is the example of um, how do you um, how do you train a self-driving car? Well, one way would be to have all the sensors or whatnot loaded up on a machine and just let it go and see what happens, right? Um, one of the things that's really uh, been crucial to the development of uh, autonomous vehicles is the idea of synthetic data, right? Uh, plenty of game engines exist that can produce a photorealistic uh, world in real time, and ultimately, um, you know, no one gets hurt, right? So, you, you know, if you see videos of this, you know, the, the first thing the car does is goes forward, it hits something, something, right? Well, then that, then that loses its life, it gets penalized, and eventually it learns over thousands, if not millions of iterations, how to safely drive. Now, um, one of the interesting uh, use cases here is you could train across different scenarios. You can control the variables in a simulation, right? You can control the amount of weather, the amount of traffic, the road conditions. Are there potholes? Are there trees down on the road? Like, how would you handle that? Um, so synthetic data and very real, uh, particularly in reinforcement learning, turns out to be very good. I would also say it also works out pretty well in terms of computer vision problems, right? Because one example uh, I'll give is to say you wanted to recognize a truck. All right. Well, what type of truck? Okay. Well, we'll narrow it down to a, let's we'll say a tractor trailer, right? Um, you can uh, teach a computer vision uh, model, but a computer vision model is only as good as the data that it learns on, right? Like all AI models. But what if you wanted to know, uh, well, what about foggy at sunset, right? How would your model perform? Well, you don't really know unless you get a picture, multiple pictures of multiple angles of a semi truck um, and in uh, in that type of environment but what you could do is you could basically use a game engine and a script to calculate tens of thousands of variations of a photo of a truck in different lighting conditions weather conditions you name it damage um, you know missing headlight etc 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 and then the advantage of that is if you write the script properly and chances are you will, um, you automatically have the data labeled. Now, there's been numerous research uh, 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 information posted about this. I think Microsoft Research recently published um, that their, um, their AI, their, they're basically using a game engine generating faces, um, you know, is just as accurate, even though it never saw a real human face until the testing phase, it was just as accurate. Now, that's good because you can, really script through a variety of types of faces, you know, so you don't have that, that any kind of implicit bias in it, that it, you can automatically script that so you can run through every conceivable variation. Now, the next thing I like to point out is that incentives drive behavior. Um, and um, I don't know if you've ever been to Costco on a Saturday afternoon in the United States, but it looks something like this. Um, so, the fascinating thing about um, uh, all of this, and I see that I'm a little short on time, so I'm going to skip ahead a couple of slides. But ultimately, um, this is really kind of the the, um, the 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 aha moment I think a lot of people had about this. So AlphaGo um, took three days and uh, to beat the 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 best human player. Um, this is AlphaGo Zero, so it had no human interruption intervention in terms of the data that it was trained on. It was basically learning by example, learning by playing the game. And this is the power of reinforcement learning. These, this could play in 40 days, millions of lifetimes worth of Go, right? So the fact that we can do this on a computer and the fact that we can do this in such a way is really a good example, uh, I think, of really what the future looks like for this field. Um, so again, I'm going to mention uh, I work for Red Hat, so I want to show you, hopefully, um, I will show you, uh, give me one second, that is the wrong window. This is what happens when you have too many monitors. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to queue them up, and uh, I'm happy to answer them. And um, all right. Hang on.
All right, so I'm going to restart that. Hopefully, the server will finally kick off. Um, so this is Red Hat OpenShift Data Science, all the data science tools you like, but it's in a Kubernetes uh, container, uh, containerized, and can run on anyone's cloud, yours, um, Microsoft's, or anyone else's. And while I wait for that to start, I will hopefully um, show you this uh, while the kernel is starting. All right, so reinforcement learning basically works like this. You have an environment, simulated or real, uh, and you have an agent, AKA your bot. And this bot will examine the state of the environment, and then it'll take an action. And then based on that action, it will update the state. Uh, the, the environment changes based on the action that it took. And then based on how that works, um, it will do a reward. So in the event that this demo does not work, I have a backup plan, and my backup plan is to show you the cached output, which is the true beauty of Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, so this is known as the uh, multi-armed bandit problem. I recently gave this presentation at a talk in Las Vegas. Um, and ultimately, uh, it's about figuring out which one of these um, uh, machines will pay up the most. Right, so slot machines themselves are called one-arm bandits because they take your money. A multi-arm bandit problem is basically a bank of slot machines. So what I'm gonna do is, uh, this is all in Python, so I'm gonna just basically create a, uh, a simulated environment. I'm gonna say I create a uh, bank of five slot machines, randomly pick their payout odds, and this is what the ground truth is, right? And the ground truth is that first slot machine, slot machine zero, uh, pays out a 54%, 27%, uh, 42%, 84%, and 0.4%, uh, uh, which of course, these are not realistic odds. As I like to say, if you find a bank of slot machines that pays out this well, well call me. Um, but this is what the agent knows at, far, at first. It doesn't know anything about the environment. So I'm setting up the rest of the simulation of playing a machine. And I know I'm uh, close on time, so I want to... Uh, kind of go through that quickly. I'm creating this environment. I'm creating this. I'm going to run this simulation, say, 10 times. And I'm going to just do a test, right? Because you can always test the environment. You want to make sure the simulation is as close to reality as possible. Um, and you'll see that on slot machine four, with the 84% chance of winning, um, I win nine times out of 10, um, which is close enough to 84%. And on machine five, where the odds are uh, very low, I lose every time. Fun fact, I did run this a thousand times and it does, the math does check out. So this is one of the algorithms inside of Epsilon, uh, inside of reinforcement learning is the idea of Epsilon greedy. And it's basically the, the, the paradox of, do you explore or do you exploit? And what this means for slot machines is, do you sit at the same machine that you know will pay out and keep playing, keep playing the machine in the hopes that you have a guaranteed winner? Or, do you, every once in a while, do you look around and try another machine in the hopes that it will do better, right? Uh, a lot of this is built on game theory. So what I built here was this uh, multi arm bandit solution. Um, and there's this notion of Epsilon 10. So Epsilon 10 is the idea that I'm going to explore 10% of the times, 10% of the, of the times I pull the lever on the slot machine. Well, wait, 10% of the time, I'm going to go try a new slot machine, right? And... Um, running through this, uh, this is the actual odds, um, and this is the, um, the odds that my bot has learned. Um, that's with a 10% being curious and exploratory. Uh, now, now I'm going to start with not doing this at all. And I, I don't know how it is in the rest of the world, but there are definitely casinos I've been to in, in, in the U.S. And, in, and parts of Europe where there's always somebody playing the same machine for hours at a time. And, um, you know, so this, by setting that value to zero, I'm simulating that, right? It's never going to try another machine. And I want to point out right here that the total reward is 4830. Um, and the reward for being 10% curious is 7800. Hold on to that thought. I also, because I never played any, anything but the first machine, there was no, there was no learning, basically. Um, so now I'm going to go completely the opposite. I'm going to be curious. I'm never going to play the same machine twice in a row. Now, what you'll see here is that, um, well, I did a much better job of learning kind of the lay of the land, although it does tend to be rather pessimistic on the payout odds on the uh, slot machine, uh, the fifth one, uh, number four. Um, but that's interesting. So, so basically, this got me wondering, what if I ran a hyperparameter suite? 
uh, so basically saying from in one one hundredth increments from zero to one and kind of plot what that score would be because you'll see by being completely curious I really have have, have lost uh, uh, a lot of points here um, and ultimately um, as you see on this graph what happens is is that the more curious I get um, I do see a bump up right around the, the 10 to 15 percent point I do see a serious boost in what my earning my returns would be. But as it gets beyond that, it's a series of diminishing returns. And ultimately, ultimately, um, uh, to, to paraphrase from the movie Wall Street from the 80s, you know, greed is, is good, but only 10% of the time is ultimately what it is. But this does, this does teach a good lesson on when you're building a reinforcement learning bot, how, what, is, what it's being incentivized upon really matters. And I hear the... Um, the sound back on. Uh, any questions at this point? Unfortunately, we do not have any time for questions, Frank, but we appreciate okay. your presentation was so engaging. Like I'm sure late in the evening for you, late in the evening for us, but this presentation was extremely relatable and woke me up and I'll definitely be asking you some questions after the Global AI Student Conference. Well, thank you very much. Look me up on LinkedIn or on any of the social medias. Awesome. Thank you so much, Frank. Thanks.